Okay, let's take a look at some basic internal heart anatomy. Right off the bat, we have four major chambers of the heart. We have two superior chambers that receive blood. We refer to those as atria. And we have two inferior chambers that eject blood. We refer to those as ventricles. Okay? So to find the right atrium, recall that the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava both open up into it. So as I take off this cover of our model, we'll see in this cavity the space known as the right atrium. Now, separating the atria and the ventricles, we have valves that are referred to nicely as atrioventricular valves. You wouldn't call the valve that separates these two the atrioventricular valve, though, in my class. In my class, we're going to call it by its more proper name or more descriptive name. That's the tricuspid valve. So the tricuspid valve separates the right atrium and the right ventricle. Okay? You'll notice once I go through that tricuspid valve, I open up into the slower chamber. We call that the right ventricle. On the opposite side of the heart then, where we, we talked earlier, we had the right pulmonary veins and the left pulmonary veins. We said the pulmonary veins bring oxygenated blood back to the left atrium. And that's the chamber we find right there. If you take a look inside that left atrium, you'll see the opening to this valve that separates the left atrium and the left ventricle. That is commonly called the left atrioventricular valve. We won't call it that, though. We'll call it the bicuspid or the mitral valve. Bicuspid because there's two cusps as compared to the three on the right side, or the mitral valve, which I think it's more commonly called. The mitral valve is under the greatest pressure of the four heart valves, and that's the one that you'll typically find get damaged with certain disease processes like hypertension, for example. Okay, there's my four chambers. Right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, and left ventricle. Now the heart has three layers that we're going to discuss. The outer layer of the heart is referred to as the epicardium. And that's really hard to identify in our model because there's, there's uh, uh, other landmarks or features that we'll name rather than epicardium. The functional layer of the heart, if you will, the thickest layer, is all of this pink in here. We'll refer to that as the myocardium. That's what does the pumping. That's responsible for heart function. And then the inner lining, which again is kind of hard to discern on the model, we refer to that as the endocardium. And if you recall, as we, when we talked about blood clotting, the endocardium is a continuous layer with the endothelium that you find in our blood vessels. Okay? Another thing you'll notice, inside the atria, the chambers are nice and smooth. Inside the ventricles, they have this kind of lumpy, almost what we would call trabecular appearance. Remember, trabecula is the type of bone we found in the epiphyses. We called it spongy bone. Early anatomists apparently thought then that this had a similar appearance, and they refer to that appearance in the, vert in the uh, ventricles, what we call trabecula cornea. Okay? Also in the ventricles, we find a couple little tiny small muscles that protrude, these little bumps here. And often in the body, we'll see little bumps or sticky up things. We'll refer to them as papillae. Okay, we have dermal papillae, we have papillae on our tongue, for example. These little sticky up things are muscles, though, in the ventricles that we call papillary muscles. And papillary muscles then attach to these connective tissue strands that we refer to as chordae tendinae. On this particular model, the one I grabbed, the chordae tendinae have been obliterated on the right side, but here on the left you can see them nicely. Okay? So the chordae tendinae connect the papillary muscle then to the AV valves. And what happens before ventricular contraction, just a split second before, is these papillary muscles will contract and make these chordae tendinae taut. And that will prevent the AV valves from blowing up into the atria because, of course, in the heart we want our blood to flow unidirectionally. So the, the um, papillary muscles in chordae tendinae do not push the valves closed. Pressure changes do that. They simply prevent the valves from blowing in a retrograde direction. Now, between my right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk, I have a valve we just commonly refer to as the pulmonary valve, or you'll call it pulmonary semilunar. And then between the left ventricle and the aorta, we have a valve that you can see up in there. We call that the aortic valve, or you'll hear it called the aortic semilunar valve. Okay? One last feature that you'll note, and at least on this particular model, when you get inside the right atrium, you'll see a shallow depression. And in this particular model, there's that shallow depression right there. We call that the fossa ovalis. In fetal circulation, as we said in a previous video, you have shunts or bypasses where different 
um, um, systemic and pulmonary structures are connected. In fetal circulation, there was an opening between the left atrium and the right atrium, and that opening was called the foramen ovale. With pressure changes in the thorax and in the heart when the baby's born, that flap will close, and we just have a shallow depression that we refer to as the fossa ovalis. Okay? So by the time you get to your practical, you should be able to start in a chamber of the heart and trace a drop of blood from where you started all the way through the body and back to where you came. So we'll just do that real quick. We'll start with a drop of blood in the right atrium. From the right atrium, we're going to go through the tricuspid valve. That takes us into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, we're going to go through the pulmonary semilunar valve. That takes us into the pulmonary trunk. From the pulmonary trunk, we have to take blood to the left, and then we'll pivot this around, and the right lung. So from the pulmonary trunk, we go to the left and right pulmonary artery, and that takes us to the lungs. Once we get to the lungs, we have to bring blood back to the heart. Blood comes back to the heart through the right and left pulmonary veins. From the pulmonary veins, our, gonna, our blood is going to dump into the left atrium. Once we're in the left atrium, blood is going to come through the bicuspid or mitral valve. And from there, we're going to go into the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, we're going to take our blood and eject it through the aortic semilunar valve. From there, we're going to go into the aorta. From the aorta, we're going to go out to our various body systems, depending which vessels are the target. We're going to go to our body and dump off oxygen. We're going to pick up deoxygenated blood and bring that back to the heart. So from the aorta, we go to body systems. From the body systems, we're going to come back from the head, upper extremity, and superior chest. We're going to come into the super vena cava. From the inferior chest, abdomen, pelvis, and lower extremity, blood's going to come up. The inferior vena cava, regardless of which vena cava the blood is, is transported in, we're ultimately going to wind up back in that right atrium, which is where we started initially. Okay? And there's your internal heart overview.